I'm Larry Gerke. I'm Roger Bodor. And we'd like to welcome you to Luther Memorial Church's virtual worship service. Welcome! Hi, I am Jack. I'm going to be your acolyte this morning. I'm going to start second grade at Coonley in the fall. Please take a moment to prepare your hearts for worship. You may light a candle if that is meaningful and helpful to you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Lindsay Mack, and I'm happy to be worshiping with you this morning. Today we are in the eighth week of our summer series called Unraveled, where we look at different biblical characters and how their lives unraveled and then rewove into something different. So today we'll be looking at the familiar and beloved character of the woman at the well. Also today, we will be celebrating Holy Communion, so as usual, please make sure that you have on hand anything that you might like if you'd like to participate in Holy Communion. Let's begin this morning now with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Oh God, we come to church today longing to draw water that fills our souls. We come bringing our past and our present, our messy truths, our shame, and our deepest scars. As we give you our hearts, we give thanks that you meet us at the well. We pray all of this in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Let us now continue this morning with a word of confession. Please join me. Like the woman at the well, we are so often unraveled by shame. We carry shame for broken relationships. We carry shame for being unable to balance work and parenting, tithing and bills, productivity and Sabbath. We get stuck in a comparison game and in critical self monologues, consumed with the nagging feeling that we should be able to do more. Forgive us for forgetting that we are made in your image. Forgive us for forgetting that you see us and love us just as we are. Unravel the shame that unravels us. Gratefully we pray, amen. Now, beloved of God, hear this good news. Through God's tender mercy and grace, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus. Our sins are forgiven. Let us now live in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
uh, I'm Deaconess Claire and this little bug and I are out enjoying some nice weather uh, just after a rain. It's cool enough for her to take a little walk and it just so happens that our Bible story this week is about water. Well, it's about more than water and Jesus makes that very plain. So you can listen in on the sermon for that detail. But I thought it'd be kind of fun uh, if you and your parents um, or adults in your life at the moment when you're listening in on this took some time to talk about your favorite things about water so, there's so many bible stories that have it in there they're always a good reminder to us that all water stories are about life and um, they help us take a clearer vision of what it means to be alive in this world so I wonder if you have any family stories that center around water. Maybe somebody's baptism is pretty important. Maybe yours. Or maybe you have some really cool lake house stories that are important. You can talk about those things that happen in the water. Or maybe you're really little and you've never been to a lake before. Um, and your most experience with water is um, getting caught in the rain once or bath time. Um, but just think about what are the important things um, about water in your life and if you'll pray with me we will thank God for water. The Lord be with you. Good and gracious God we thank you for the gift of water, uh, for uh, water that nourishes all of creation. We thank you for thunderstorms and we thank you for rivers and lakes and oceans and seas and for all of the creatures that live in the water and uh, for all the ways that water nourishes us that we can serve you. Help us to protect the waters in our neck of the wood especially Lake Michigan and the Chicago River. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. John in the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who actually baptized, Jesus left Judea and started back to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria. So when Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, Near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had actually gone into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to Jesus, How is it that you, a Jew, Ask a drink of water from me, a woman of Samaria. Jews did not share at that time things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of the water, this water, will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty, because the water that I will give becomes in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water 
so that I may never be thirsty or have to be, keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come back. The woman answered Jesus, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one that you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to Jesus, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that this place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know because salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship God must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Jesus, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then Jesus' disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He can't be the Messiah, can he? The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Dear friends, grace to you and peace from our loving and creating God. Amen. When I read the gospel, you saw me do a series of gestures that some people do, where I make the sign of the cross three times. You make it on your forehead, on your lips, and on your heart. The meaning of that gesture when you're about to listen to the gospel in church is that the first sign of the cross is that I pray that my mind will comprehend the reading. The second sign of the cross that I do on my lips, that I will be able to proclaim the gospel that I hear. And the third sign of the cross that I make on my heart is a sign that I, my heart will cherish the gospel. It, it's an optional thing that some people do. I like to do it as a way to kind of focus myself in preparation for listening to the gospel. In this sermon series, Unraveled, that we've been focusing on this summer, it's on people of the Bible who in one way or another were experiencing their lives unraveling. We encounter today a woman sometimes called the Samaritan woman at the well. And when I reflect on her story, I noticed that in the course of her story, she does those three signs of the cross things. She understands Jesus' message. She takes Jesus' message to heart, and she proclaims Jesus' message. I'll show you how she does those things in just a moment. But first up, a little background on who she was. Her story includes the fact that she and the other Samaritans were seen as outcasts by the ancient Israelites of Jesus' time. And while they were seen as outcasts, Jesus always reaches out to people seen as outcasts. Jesus told the parable about how a man was robbed and beaten on the road to Jericho. Two people walked along that road who were part of the elite. When they saw the man injured on the side of the road, they ignored him. But when a Samaritan came along, the good Samaritan took him to a safe place and tended to him. Likewise, when Jesus met this Samaritan woman at the well, he spoke with her and asked for her help in getting a drink of water. It even took her aback a little bit because she said, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Commentators also explain that the part of her story about her having five husbands would have marked her as even more of an outcast. She wasn't even just an outcast in the way Samaritans were all outcasts. She would have been seen as an outcast even among the Samaritans. One of the saddest things we human beings do to each other 
is all of the ways that we construct systems and structures that define which group is better, which group is preferable, how we determine who matters, who doesn't, who are the outcasts. 2,000 years after Jesus' time, we've just made no progress on that. There are so many sad ways we can make someone feel less than. And this Samaritan woman at the well had no doubt felt from many people, from many directions, that she was somehow less than. Because of where she came from, some people made her feel less than. Because of choices, maybe even mistakes she had made, some people made her feel less than. The very first chapter of the Bible teaches us that humankind was created in the image of God. And the rest of human history is kind of a litany of ignoring that. Even though the Samaritan woman at the well spent so much of her life without others seeing the image of God in her, there are glimmers of how she saw the image of God in herself. There is a courage and a confidence about her. You know, while she was surprised that Jesus would even talk to her because she was from Samaria, she kept up her part of the conversation. This is where she comes to understand the message of Jesus, the first cross on the forehead. When Jesus talks about the coming salvation, she says, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. And here is where she takes Jesus' message to heart, the sign of the cross on the heart. When Jesus describes that the water that he provides, which stands for the salvation of eternal life, she asks for it. She says, Sir, give me that water. And here is where she proclaims the message of Jesus, the sign of the cross on the lips. She left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? The message of Jesus is to reach out to the outcasts, the burdened, the everyone who anyone is trying to make feel less than, and see in them the image of God. The Samaritan woman at the well went and spread that message herself to the very people who probably saw her as less than. She had been given the gift of personally speaking with the Messiah and didn't keep that to herself. That is what it means to follow Jesus. This last week, Representative John Lewis's funeral concluded. On the day of his burial, he published a final essay that he had written to be published in the New York Times on the day of his burial. I will close with the final paragraph of that essay because it invites us into that very work of peace and love to spread that message of Jesus to everyone, including anyone who would make anyone feel less than. He wrote, in my life, I have done all I can to demonstrate that the way of peace, the way of love and nonviolence, is the more excellent way. Now, it is your turn to let freedom ring. When historians pick up their pens to write the story of the 21st century, let them say that it was your generation who laid down the heavy burdens of hate at last, and that peace finally triumphed over violence, aggression, and war. So I say to you, walk with the wind, brothers and sisters, and let the spirit of peace and the power of everlasting love be your guide. Amen.
Spirit, let us pray for all who are in need, responding to the words, Lord, you are good to all, with the phrase, hear our cry and save us. O oh God, our Savior, bless your church around the world, where believers must be isolated from one another. Be present through your gracious word. Give to our bishops, pastors, deacons, and congressional leaders wisdom for their tasks in this challenging time. Lord, you are good to all. Hear our cry and save us. O oh God, creator of a wondrous earth, protect the glories of your seas and lands, replenish groundwater supplies, refresh lakes and ponds, send rains where there is drought, and shelter forests from wildfires. Lord, you are good to all. Hear our cry and save us. O oh God, sovereign of the world, form the leaders of nations to strive for justice for all. Guide our government in dealing with China strengthen the world's democracies, bring an end to racism in our society, and show our elected officials how to govern with integrity. Lord, you are good to all. Hear our cry and save us. O oh God, storehouse of goodness, visit all who face the coronavirus, especially those who are incarcerated. Give us, O oh Lord of life, a vaccine. Assist all who face eviction from their residence. Bring wholeness and healing to those who suffer in body or spirit, especially those whom we name here. Lord, you are good to all. Hear our cry and save us. In certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're the Pritzker family. Morning. I'm Alina. I'm Alice. I'm Elena. And I'm Josh. Peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Bye. Bye. Your offering to God started the moment that you got out of bed this morning. From the very way that we live our lives, from the way that we interact with people that we encounter, all of that is an offering to God. We bless the life around us in so many different ways. And one of those ways is through the giving of our tithes and offerings. For your offering, for those of you who give online or sign in to give a one-time gift, for those of you who mail checks in, for all of the ways that you give and support the ministry of LMC, we are so very grateful. I thank God for the many ways that you give and serve one another. And now um, let us prepare our hearts and minds for Holy Communion. As we prepare for communion this week, we also remember that we're concurrently worshiping with a church out in West Chicago that has a large Spanish speaking community where I'm also preaching and presiding for these four weeks. And we'll be singing a piece of communion liturgy that, that they are also singing, which is from the traditional Spanish um, liturgy. So the words are, holy, 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 my heart, my heart adores you. My heart is glad to say the words, you are holy God. So let us now take a moment to prepare our hearts and minds for communion. The Lord be with you and also with you. 
Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 my heart, my heart adores you. My heart is glad to say the words you are holy. In the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, blessed it and broke it, gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The table of God is ready. It is a table where all are welcome, no matter our stories, our joys, our struggles, our griefs, our challenges, our hopes, or our fears, for this is God's table. So come to this table, you who are feeling unraveled, and you who feel like God is stitching something new together in you, you who are hopeful, and you who are despairing, we come however we find ourselves today, for God will meet us here. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Please come. fourth grade and I will be your communion server today. This is the body of Christ for you. This is the blood of Christ for you.
My name is Heather Vanderberg. I have a couple of announcements for you this morning. First, we'd very much like to thank everyone who responded to the outdoor worship survey. We had 77 independent responses with lots of good feedback. That survey is now closed um, and we'll be using the information to determine whether or not we can move forward with outdoor worship and what that will look like. Second, specifically for families with children in pre-K three through fourth grade, we forgot another survey for you. Um, our youth, child, youth, and family team is working really hard to figure out what faith formation is going to look like and how we can best support uh, families as we navigate this new normal. And we would like some input from you on activities that you are comfortable with, days and times, things like that. The survey can be found in News and Notes. It's also linked to our bio on Instagram, and we should have it up on the website sometime this week at lmcchicago.org slash announcements. If you have any questions about the survey, please feel free to reach out directly to Deaconess Claire at family at lmcchicago.org. Thanks so much and have a wonderful Sunday. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ 
May it strengthen you and give you peace and courage. Now receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Hello, we are the Toms family. I'm Derek. I'm Vicki. I'm Allison. We hope you have a wonderful week and we'll see you next Sunday. And now, go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Yeah.